Oh, what is some? I just have something to tell you. I'm sitting down here at Denny's, and there was a little girl that just walked in that looks exactly like that girl. Okay, is she still inside? Yes, she is. And she's with an older man. With an older I, man? Yeah, and, and the thing that really triggered me the most was I was reading the Nickelverse, and I seen her picture in the Nickelverse, and I showed it to one of the waitresses here, and she said, oh my God, she's in here. When a missing little girl is spotted at a store and then a local Denny's, the other customers couldn't believe their eyes. What were the chances that a child who had been abducted weeks earlier was sitting right in front of them in broad daylight? Bro, uh, bro, 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 stop telling me in chat, I'm being fucking annoying, bro. Bro, stop saying, address it, I address that. I don't give a fuck, holy shit, holy fuck. Dude, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know what you want from me. Jesus Christ, brother. I do not, I genuinely don't care, brother. I don't care. My God. But as the police arrived on the scene, they quickly realized the horrifying case that shook not only the city of Coeur d'Alene to its core, but also the entire country was far more grisly than they'd expected. And worse than that, the perpetrator was even more depraved than anyone could have ever imagined. And this was only just the beginning of his crimes. May 16, 2005 was a typical rainy day in the Pacific Northwest until an urgent 911 call came in from a resident of Kootenai County, Idaho. The resident initially called 911 to report a white pickup truck parked on his property that he didn't recognize. Unbeknownst to the caller, this would spark the beginning of an investigation that would send authorities head first into the most disturbing case they had ever discovered. As the 911 operator gathered more information, the caller looked inside the vehicle and noted a few belongings. The only thing in the front seat is, a, is, a, is an axe and a little toolbox. Then, later that day, dispatch received another 911 call from the same man. And this time, it was clear that something was horribly wrong. Um, okay, you need to... Back shots is simply the position, in a sentence it's used like, Forsen gave XQC back shots after beating his record. Oh god, yeah, yeah. I gave back shots, I gave back shots. Wow. Also, I might, might have texted about back shots. I did that pretty often, actually, pretty commonly. Here's what it is. Talk to a deputy about the vehicle for what reason? Yeah, I sure do. Okay, what's going on with the vehicle? Well, the vehicle... I can't explain it to you. You just have the guy call me quickly. Well, they, they need to know what's going on. Is there... Is... The vehicle, there's nothing wrong with the vehicle okay. that I can see. But the vehicle belongs to a guy who is friends with the people that live in this junky house out here. And I went to the door to pay the little kid $10 for mowing the lawn and there's blood all over the door. Oh. Nobody comes to the door. They are uh, friends of the guy who owns this pickup, I find out. Okay. Okay, let me have a deputy give you a call back at that 661 number then, okay? Yeah, right away. All right. Many of the details presented in this video have never been heard before and were obtained from actual police reports, along with chilling crime scene photos. As it turns out, the caller owned a nearby house adjacent to his property and rented it out to a couple. 40-year-old Brenda Groney, and her boyfriend, 37-year-old Mark McKenzie. Brenda had three children from a previous marriage who also lived in the home, 13-year-old Slade, 9-year-old Dylan, and 8-year-old Shasta. Authorities raced through the steady rainfall to the rural Wolf Lodge home and made their way down the dirt driveway. As they continued their approach, they stopped to peek inside the family's vehicle, which was parked a short distance away from the residence. Officers glimpsed a hunting rifle lying on the front seat and also noticed what appeared to be bullet holes in the rear windows. As they moved closer to the home, several blood stains on and around the front door became visible. Deputies also noted blood in a pool of rainwater that had formed in the grass next to the walkway. They attempted to elicit a response from the family by pounding on the locked front door and demanding someone open up but the only answer they received was that of dogs barking. They quickly proceeded to the back door and discovered it had been left ajar. Authorities immediately took one of the visibly frightened dogs into custody. The other, however, remained hiding inside the home. They would soon uncover the source behind the dog's extreme fear. Inside the kitchen, an officer made a most gruesome discovery. 
the body of a teenage young man was lying face down on the floor, his head wrapped and his hands bound behind his back with duct tape. Then in the area between the kitchen and living room, the officer spotted another victim, a fully dressed adult woman also lying face down on the floor. Her hands were cuffed behind her back using heavy duty zip ties in a manner similar to that practiced by law enforcement. Duct tape had also been used to restrain the woman's ankles and feet. Horrifyingly, there was yet another body lying face down in the living room. The adult male victim was dressed only in shorts, and zip ties had been used to bind his wrists and ankles together. The officers confirmed all three were deceased. They then searched the rest of the home for additional victims where they located several firearms in the upstairs loft area. And after a thorough search, it was confirmed that there was no one else inside the residence. Little did they know, however, that the worst was yet to come. Oh, come on, Upon further investigation, authorities uncovered more troubling information. One officer reported that welfare checks at the Wolf Lodge home were not uncommon, and that the family members who lived in the home frequently came and went, with friends often staying over as well. Therefore, authorities thought that perhaps the two youngest children had been staying elsewhere, as that seemed to be common practice. Later that night, detectives went to the prosecuting attorney's office to obtain a search warrant for the Wolf Lodge property in the abandoned truck. While they were there, an unexpected call came through to the police station from a man named Steve Groney, the father of the three children living at the residence with their mother and her boyfriend. And he was desperate for any information regarding the gruesome incident. An officer was dispatched to meet with Steve, and what he told them sent the case in a shocking new direction. According to the concerned father, all three of his children should have been present in the home on the night of the murders, but with only one adolescent victim accounted for inside the house, that meant the two younger children were missing. The victims were determined to be 40-year-old Brenda, 37-year-old Mark, and 13-year-old Slade, leaving 9-year-old Dylan and 8-year-old Shasta unaccounted for. As a result, officers issued an Amber Alert for the two children just after midnight on the day after the bodies were found. Detectives then returned to the Wolf Lodge home and with a new sense of urgency began a desperate search in the nearby woodlands for Shasta and Dylan. That, Though, isn't that a long time after the disappearance? So doesn't like the rate at which people can get recovered goes down dramatic after like 24 hours or something like that? They hoped to find the children alive. They feared the worst. That same morning, as the rain finally subsided, the clear light of day exposed just how disturbing and graphic the interior crime scene really was. Investigators found a sizable blood smear on the back door and several blood droplets inside and outside the door. Then, upon entering the home, they saw many dried blood stains, some even containing grass clippings from the freshly mowed lawn. Prominent red smears on the swinging doors leading to the kitchen suggested that someone covered in blood had moved through them. The glass-topped coffee table was shattered, leaving fragments of glass scattered about the living space. Furthermore, there seemed to be blood everywhere, from the furniture to the walls. Authorities followed a crimson trail of smears and stains down the hallway to a bedroom, where they found a massive quantity of blood on the bedding. Finally, while there wasn't any blood in the upstairs loft area, detectives did uncover a single plastic zip tie from the floor, matching those used on the victims. It was clear that the evidence inside the home told a terrifying story, but it became even more horrific as authorities examined the bodies further. It became apparent that Slade initially had duct tape covering his mouth that had either slipped or been pushed down around his neck. He also had red stains covering the bottoms of his bare feet giving the appearance that he had walked through blood at some point during the attack. It appeared the young man had suffered severe catastrophic injuries to his head and other portions of his body, inflicted by some kind of blunt instrument. Ultimately, the severe beating resulted in his death. Slade's head was lying at the feet of his mother, Brenda. Unfortunately, due to the ghastly blunt force injuries to her head, law enforcement couldn't even recognize her face. Not to mention layers of duct tape were entangled in her hair and wrapped around her head to form a makeshift gag. It was only due to the presence of several recognizable tattoos that they were able to positively confirm her identity. 
Unlike the other two, Mark had no duct tape on, on his body, but similarly, he showed several blunt force trauma wounds to his head that clearly penetrated his skull. Investigators also suspected that a bloodied person had moved over him as he lay on the floor based on a distinct pattern of blood droplets on his body. Most horrifying was the revelation that the murder weapon had been a framing hammer as each strike left behind a circular marking with a cross-hatched pattern on its victim. Meanwhile, authorities continued to focus their efforts on finding Dylan and Shasta, treating the situation as a possible abduction by a dangerous predator. The Kootenai County Sheriff's Office requested assistance from the FBI and other resources to help locate the missing children. Over the next several weeks, the entire country held its breath as the search for Dylan and Shasta unfolded in real time on national television. Desperate to find answers, Dylan and Shasta's father, Steve, even contacted a psychic to aid in the search. Unfortunately, those efforts proved futile. Several leads also came in from friends, family, and locals, but each failed guys, to yield guys, any guys. results. Don't say question mark, chat. Guys, if you're a parent, okay, and there's nothing you can do, okay, you feel like you've exhausted all your options and you're desperate, brother, I would call a psychic, okay? Bro, I'd, I'd fucking, I'd do a, I'd put some stones out in the backyard, I'd fucking summon God, okay, or some shit. I'd do whatever. Okay. Okay. This is what it is. Finally, on July 2nd, nearly two excruciating months after the murders, authorities got the call they'd been waiting for. Yeah, hi, friends. This is the manager, Denise. Yeah. I've got a little girl here with a tall gentleman, and she looks so much like this, uh... Okay, are they still in the building? Yeah, they're at the table 20. A woman working at a Denny's restaurant in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, believes she recognized Shasta from missing persons flyers and alerted the authorities. The caller reported that the little girl was with an unknown male and described his physical appearance. And can you describe the male to me? I'd say 6'3". Okay. Really slim. Okay. Dark hair? Yeah, curly. Curly. The hat on. The hat on. The dispatcher wasted no time and immediately sent officers to the restaurant. And we're not sure, you know, I just, she looks so much like her and I just, I don't know. All right, we'll have someone start that way. Okay, thank you. And if they leave, call us right back, please. Sure. All right, thank you. Uh -huh. Then another call came in that heightened the belief that this was, in fact, Shasta. I just have something to tell you. I'm sitting down here at Denny's and there was a little girl that just walked in that looked exactly like that. Okay, is she still inside? Yes, she is. And she's with an older man. With an older I, man? Yeah, and, and the thing that really triggered me the most was I was reading the Nickelverse, and I seen her picture in the Nickelverse, and I showed it to one of the waitresses here, and she said, oh my God, she's in here. This caller had a strong sense of urgency and seemed even more confident that they had potentially found the missing child. I don't know if you guys just want to send a deputy down to look, you know, just maybe check through the windows or whatever. I don't know what you guys would want to do, but it's just, it's just often weird to me. The girl looks exactly like the little girl. She looks really, really a lot like the female that sits in the paper. Authorities arrived on the scene, and the man with the little girl was quickly identified as 42-year-old Joseph Edward Duncan III, the third. from Fargo, North Dakota. Soon, detectives also discovered that Joseph had a lengthy criminal history. Multiple warrants. This guy is um, criminal conduct, um, carnal abuse. He's an escape risk. Okay. I still haven't got all of the warrants figured out yet. According to the reports, Joseph had been committing violent crime since he was just 15 years old. And by the time he was 17, he was sentenced to 20 years in prison for a crime against a 14-year-old boy. He was released on parole in 1994 after serving 14 years. And then in March 2005, Joseph was charged with another crime against two boys. After a doctor friend helped him post bail, he seemingly disappeared without a trace. Oh my God, oh my God. How does he get, bro, how does a repeat offender like this get bail? What? Brother. What the fuck is March going on? Joseph was charged with another crime against two boys. After a doctor friend helped him post bail, he seemingly disappeared without a trace until now. During this time, authorities also learned from dispatch that Joseph had several vehicles tied to his name. He's attached to a red Pontiac as a suspect vehicle. He's also attached to a red Jeep Cherokee that's a stolen vehicle. Joseph had driven to the restaurant in a red Jeep bearing false Missouri plates. 
And as it turns out, God, the vehicle had it? been stolen from an Enterprise yeah. rent-a-car in St. Paul, Minnesota. It's so clean. Is it her? All right, yeah, she's not going to Bye-bye. News soon broke that the little girl with Joseph was, in fact, Shasta, and she had an unbelievably horrific story to tell. Before even leaving the Denny's restaurant, Shasta reportedly told authorities about the deaths at Wolf Lodge and that Joseph was the perpetrator. Then she was transported to a nearby hospital for treatment. Officers contacted her father, Steve Groney, and he raced to the hospital to be by his daughter's side. Of course, authorities immediately took Joseph Duncan into custody, but one important question was still hanging in the air. Where was young Dylan? Authorities soon uncovered surveillance footage from a convenience store in Coeur d'Alene. Their findings were ominous. Joseph and Shasta could be viewed seemingly traveling alone. Then, later that same day, an officer experienced in working with children visited Shasta in the hospital where she recounted her grueling version of the events leading to that point. Please be aware that the following details came directly from Shasta and are incredibly upsetting. Your discretion is advised. Shasta recalled being abruptly woken up by her mother on the night of May 16th and told that an intruder was in the home. Then she went into the living room where her entire family had been ordered to lay on the floor, were bound and held at gunpoint. She identified the intruder as Joseph Duncan, a man she claimed to have never seen or met before in her life. After a few moments of silent terror, Joseph tapped Shasta on the head and gave her a simple shush gesture as he picked her up and carried her out the back door. Shasta was laid on the grass outside and warned that she would be hurt or killed if she didn't stay quiet. She said Dylan was brought out and laid on the grass beside her a short time later. Joseph then went back inside, and that's when things took a deadly turn. Shasta told the detective that she heard Mark shouting, ow, or ouch, sometime after Joseph re-entered the home. Then, unaware of what had happened to her family, she explained seeing Slade walking around outside acting very strangely. After that, the next thing Shasta recalled was that she and Dylan were being loaded into a pickup truck and driven to a nearby property where Joseph then transferred them to the stolen red Jeep. Shasta continued, telling the detective that Joseph drove them out to the remote wilderness of Montana, where they stayed at various campsites. She claimed Joseph slapped her very hard and would chain her and Dylan to trees whenever he had to leave the campsite. Shasta also remarked that he would put small pills in their drinking water, but she didn't know what was in them. Furthermore, the little girl described how Joseph had forced her and Dylan to write letters to their father while being held at the campsites. One letter written by Shasta indicated that Joseph had been giving them some hope of a safe return, saying, we might see you guys again. In his letter, Dylan wrote, we are still alive, we're okay, we know what happened to mom. On one occasion, Shasta said that Joseph left her chained to a tree while he took Dylan away for a long time. When they returned, Dylan was noticeably injured, and Shasta eventually learned that they had gone to an abandoned cabin in the woods, where Joseph tortured the young boy for hours. Joseph actually showed Shasta a video recording of her brother, with his hands tied behind his back, being assaulted and hung by a wire noose from the cabin's crossbeam. What is going on? In the video, then? Joseph shouts, The devil is here, boy, the devil himself. The devil likes to watch children suffer and cry. Bro, what is the going recording, on with Joseph this guy? brought Dylan down and revived him, promising to take him to the hospital. At one point, Joseph started to sing the Lord's Prayer using an eerily high voice. As he sang, Thy will be done, he interrupted himself and shouted, Can this be your will? You put people on the earth to do this. How can you do this? How can you let me? God, where are you? Show yourself. Tragically, Shasta's next admission removed any remaining hope that Dylan was still alive. She told the detective about another incident in which Joseph reached inside a container, presumably to grab a beer, and fired a shotgun from inside the container, fatally shooting young Dylan. What? It's unclear whether or not the shot was accidental, but nevertheless, Joseph then apparently burned the young boy's body in a fire at the campsite. Then he packed oh Shasta into the Jeep and drove back to Coeur d'Alene. 
As they drove through the town, Joseph decided they'd make a stop at the Denny's restaurant, which is precisely when the 911 calls about a little girl resembling Shasta started flooding in. Before the interview ended, Shasta explained to the detective in graphic detail what Joseph had told her about the fateful night at Wolf Lodge and how he had killed her entire family. She also reiterated that he was a total stranger not known by anyone in her family. But then, just when investigators thought they were nearing the end of this nightmare, Shasta said one last thing that stunned the detective right to his core. Shasta shockingly informed the investigator that Joseph claimed to have committed other violent murders in the past. Without any more information, the interview ended, and authorities immediately prepared a search warrant for the stolen Jeep Joseph had been driving. They also made preparations to search the probable crime scene in Montana. Forensic analysts began searching the stolen Jeep and found evidence on the exterior that suggested it had recently been driven on dusty, brush-filled roads. Brother! Next, they examined... Brother, if this guy didn't abduct anybody, he would have probably had a good chance of getting away with it. Actually... Almost 100%, to be honest. In the interior and noted several perfectly normal items, such as tourist brochures, GPS units, camping equipment, and a laptop computer. However, it wasn't long before they uncovered some more sinister items inside the vehicle, including duct tape, rope, and video production equipment. Oh, but that wasn't all. Investigators also found a sawed-off shotgun with duct tape wrapped around the handle, a handsaw, and a plastic zip-tie bag matching the brand used in the murders. Authorities sent the digital media found in the Jeep to the FBI Computer Forensics Unit for analysis, who were able to narrow down the search area in Montana. Then on July 3rd, just one day after Shasta's rescue, authorities located a cabin in the Montana wilderness that seemed to match the one from Joseph's recordings. Still, despite extensive search efforts, Dylan's remains were nowhere to be found. Meanwhile, the FBI Computer Forensics Laboratory continued to pull evidence from Joseph's film equipment, including extremely graphic video clips from inside the old Montana cabin depicting the horrendous torture of Dylan. The following day, desperate to find Dylan's remains, authorities began to consider taking Shasta to Montana to aid in the search. Before that could happen, however, they received a call that changed everything. FBI personnel searching in St. Regis, Montana, alerted deputies back in Idaho that human remains suspected to be those of Dylan had been located in a mountainous area, matching that which Shasta had previously described. And how did they find that? The same that? day Dylan's remains were found, Joseph requested to speak with a jail chaplain, telling him he wanted to talk about forgiveness because he killed three people in a house. Four days later, he dogs. sat for a long-awaited interview with Kootenai County detectives regarding the Wolf Lodge case. Authorities discovered that Joseph kept an encrypted journal online called The Fifth Nail, which he started in 2004. Decades later, the journal was broken into, revealing Joseph's twisted mindset. He wrote on the blog just days before the attack at Wolf Lodge. One post written on May 11, 2005 reads... To be more specific, I am scared, alone, and confused, and my reaction is to strike out toward the perceived source of my misery, society. My intent is to harm society as much as I can, then die. As for the happy Joe, Jet, well, he was just a dream. The boogeyman was alive and happy long before Happy Joe. Even more disturbing, on February 17, 2005, Joseph wrote, as long as we keep attacking the symptoms of social disease, the so-called offenders, then our problems will keep getting worse. Someday, soon I hope, society will be forced to wake up and recognize how it propagates its own misery by denying the truth that criminals are victims too. <laughs> he expanded on these thoughts, writing 11 days later. Actual yes, I know a lot Andy. about abuse from all three sides, the victims, the offenders, and the systems. I'm not saying let offenders do their thing. I have no problem with taking direct measures to stop people from hurting people. But I think it is more effective to take direct measures to stop people from wanting to hurt people. We should offer free offender counseling and even amnesty for certain types of offenses if the offender agrees to treatment before they're caught. That would be a very practical and effective way to reduce crimes dramatically. I doubt it will ever happen, though, because our society loves the excitement that offenders bring into our living rooms through the media 
and we would be lost without someone to point our fingers at. It's important to remember that just days... I mean, well... Brother, 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 brother. This is very rich coming from the guy who did all that at all those ages. This guy is like a... What... What you would consider someone who was given all the chances. He did really dumb shit when he was really young. And he was given chances. He, he absolutely was. And he says, oh, dude, dude, this is, this is like, bro, this is the most ironic person the media, out there. And we would be lost without someone to point our fingers at. Well, he did sex crimes at 15. Okay. He was, st he was still given a chance to live a, a pretty much normal life. And he, he fucked up. And he wants people to have leniency and get people to learn. Bro, he was given that. Point our fingers at. It's important to remember that just days after writing this, Joseph was torturing and assaulting Dylan prior to murdering him. When speaking nope. to detect- 20 years was for something that he did afterwards. Dibs Joseph told them that he just happened to pass by the Wolf Lodge home and noticed Shasta and Dylan playing in their swimsuits in the yard. That's when he decided to pull over and survey the residence, thus putting his evil plan to abduct the children into motion. He may have been driving around and searching for his target as he was prepared with items in his vehicle to subdue the victims. It's likely that he'd fantasized about a scenario like this many times. And when he spotted the kids, he saw this as his opportunity to act. They asked him to provide his account of exactly what happened on the night of May 16th. Joseph said he arrived on the Wolf Lodge property in the stolen Jeep sometime between 2 and 3 a.m. with plans to approach the residence through the open field. At this point, Joseph went into... I don't agree with this. This, this standard of the, this like weird shit of saying, dude, he was mentally ill, he was mentally, bro, do you know how many people are mentally ill, dude? How many people? A fuck ass, dank them million, uh, millions of people are mentally ill. None of them go out in the fucking woods and camp out some fucking house and wait to com commit a fucking double abduction, triple kill in the most gruesome way possible. You absolute fucking unhinged chatter. What is wrong with you, bro? What is wrong with you, bro? great detail about the extra measures he took to ensure he left no trace behind, stating he was very knowledgeable of criminal procedures and crime scene processing. Joseph proudly explained how he intentionally bought disposable shoes. Yes, 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 yes. This term is not a gamer term. Something, something, gamer term, bro. bro yes, whenever they, it, it, is, it is a police used term. Uh, in crime, sometimes they do. Triple kill, double kill, they do that. Or the homicide, but sometimes kill. Much larger than his actual size it, it, to throw off the problem. investigation. He boasted that he used gloves to avoid leaving any fingerprints. Then he continued to tell detectives that he surveyed the Wolf Lodge home with night vision goggles as he moved across the large field surrounding the residence. Joseph said he took extra care to be quiet because he knew dogs were inside the home. However, while he expressed concern over establishing where the parents' room was located, he appeared to already know exactly where the children slept at night. Detectives surmised that he likely gathered this information from stalking the two children before the attack. Nevertheless, once he felt confident that there was no movement inside and everyone was asleep, Joseph placed himself directly outside Shasta and Dylan's room. He stood on a lawn chair and peered intently inside the window, ready to enter and snatch them from their beds. But then, something happened that sent the night in a deadly new direction. One of the family's two dogs suddenly entered the bedroom and seemed to sense something was wrong as it began sniffing around the room. Then the dog unexpectedly looked directly up at the window where Joseph stood, frozen, and began to growl. Joseph instantly jumped off the chair and ran to a fence line on the property, saying at this moment he thought to himself, shit, he made me. It seemed as though he was blaming the dogs for what happened next as being made is slaying for being caught or seen. Joseph said he waited by the fence for approximately one hour to see if anyone had been alerted by the dog, but no one came out to investigate, and he didn't notice any movement inside the home. Joseph told detectives of this time spent waiting outside, I kept looking for excuses to not do what I was going to do. Joseph also claimed he was nearly ready to abort the entire plan, looking for any excuse just to leave, but ultimately decided that if he returned and found the back door unlocked, he would go through with the crime. 
But if the door was locked, he would leave the family alone. I mean, dude, it's a fucking so Joseph said he walked nowhere, back dude. to the home, and as fate would have it, the door was slightly. What, what an absolute fucking cuck lord to say shit like that, brother! It's a fucking house in the middle of nowhere, dude. Dude, it, it, the lock rate of doors over there is probably like fucking ten percent or some shit, man. Open. He entered the residence carrying the sawed-off shotgun, with the first round being a bird shot to scare off the dogs if necessary. The second round, he said, was a slug intended for the man. Much to his surprise, the dogs didn't seem to notice as he opened the back door, but Joseph said he still retreated to the fence line for roughly a half hour to build his nerve. Then he equipped himself with duct tape and zip ties from a backpack he left in the field and quietly approached the back door again, wearing a hat and a mask. Joseph said that when he entered the home, he found Brenda asleep on the sofa. He then stated, I froze. I didn't expect anyone to be in the living room. Joseph explained that he felt scared for a brief moment as he backed into the kitchen and waited to see if she would move, but the house remained quiet. So he continued to look around for the two dogs, and as he moved down the hallway, the dogs abruptly charged toward him from inside Slade's bedroom. Joseph described swinging the shotgun in their direction, fully prepared to shoot, but said the dogs quickly scampered away at the sight of the firearm. Joseph ducked down to hide, saying he could see from that position that Brenda had woken up. However, while she appeared to be looking directly at him, Joseph said she didn't seem to sense that anything was amiss yet, as she turned the light off and returned to lying on the couch. Joseph reported that her eyes seemed to be fixed on him, but he couldn't tell whether they were open or not, so he decided it was time to make a drastic move. This is a, this is he made his, his way over to Brenda, would... and with the shotgun trained on her, Joseph harshly whispered in a low voice, Where's your husband? He said that Brenda looked up at him with a confused expression on her face, so he repeated the question with more intensity. This time, Brenda replied that her husband wasn't in the house, so Joseph instead demanded that she bring him to the man. Then, Joseph said Brenda quickly got onto her feet and dashed up the stairs to where Mark was sleeping. He instructed Brenda to wake up Mark, and she did so by shaking him and shouting, There's a man here with a gun. Joseph told detectives that Mark then rolled over and locked eyes with him. But for unknown reasons, the cold-blooded killer became overwhelmed with emotion at this point in the interview. After regaining his composure, Joseph described grabbing two sets of zip ties he had earlier interlocked in a police-type fashion to restrain the adults. However, he hadn't anticipated Mark's size and soon realized he would need to use both sets to secure his wrists. Furthermore, he fumbled with the zip ties at the top of the stairs, dropping the one that crime scene analysts later found while searching the home. Joseph said Mark complied and continued to lie face down on the bed as Brenda was ordered to fasten the zip ties around his wrists and ankles. Next, with Mark immobilized, Joseph asked where the guns were, wanting the couple to believe his sole mission was to steal them, not to abduct the children. He likely said this to prevent the adults from trying to fight back. Yeah. Most people won't risk their... Yeah, they won't risk their lives, especially... Especially when, since he had a fucking, um, what was that? Like a double barrel sawed off or whatever, or single shot? I mean, on, on paper, if they, if they thought they were there, that he was there to kill, I mean, they would have probably rushed him and just went for it. Their lives over a robbery, but would in order to protect their children from abduction. Mark and Brenda couldn't run because they weren't going to leave their children behind, and they were likely afraid to fight Joseph because he had such a clear advantage with the weapon. Mark made his way down the stairs on his backside, and once they were both in the living room, Joseph prompted him to lie face down on the floor. Then he advised Brenda to wake up the children and bring them out. Joseph recalled hearing Slade shout, Why? 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 as his mother alerted him to the danger. With Slade out of his room, Brenda went into Shasta and Dylan's room and guided them back to the living area, where Joseph bound their wrists using duct tape and zip ties. When the entire family was secured on the living room floor, Joseph told the detectives, I stood for a moment and surveyed my work. I thought how easy it was. The following sequence of events lined up precisely with what Shasta had told investigators about Joseph carrying her and Dylan outside and laying them on the grass. After bringing the children outside, Joseph returned to his backpack at the fence line. I think his entire story, at least from this part, from his testimony, with a grain of salt, of because somebody like that, 
um, it has all these like th- uh, uh, like a meaning, like a calling behind behind or something, like a whole story. They're delusional. Okay, so of course they're gonna say things and say it in a way that makes them look uh, a certain way. It is just what it is. This is their version of this is how they see their own actions, which is sort of like whatever. Dude, I don't. And retrieved the framing hammer before re-entering the home. Once inside, he removed the duct tape from Slade's ankles and guided him outside to a spot where he was out of sight of the other children. Without warning, Joseph violently hit Slade in the back of his head with the hammer. He immediately fell to his knees, and at that point, Joseph struck him again, prompting the 13-year-old to fall face down on the ground. Assuming he was dead, Joseph went back inside the house and told Brenda to stand, but because she was bound at the ankles, Joseph had to help her up. Once she was upright, Joseph said he tried to use the hammer's claw in to cut through the duct tape around her ankles so she could walk. But instead, Brenda was sent face first back onto the floor when he pulled up on the weapon. Joseph stated that Brenda was clearly injured from the fall, so he decided it was time to end her pain. Yeah. At this point in the interview... Told you. Told you. I knew someone down the line, he would glorify some of this shit, and he would twist the narrative because of some, some stupid ass fucking mindset that he has. You, he briefly spoke about his empathetic side, saying, what I did next was an act of compassion. Then he expressed hitting Brenda two or three times in the head with the hammer. After he was satisfied that she was no longer alive, he moved over to Mark, who he stated was still realizing what was happening and struck him two or three times on the top of his head. Joseph said Mark cried out, ouch, before going still just as Shasta had previously told detectives. Joseph then went back outside and noticed that Dylan and Shasta were both propped up against their- What, is there music? Or was that in real life? Joseph then went back outside and noticed that Dylan and Shasta- Oh my fucking God, dude. Oh my God, man. That were both propped up against their orders to remain laying down and were speaking with Slade who Joseph was shocked to find alive and moving around the house's exterior, presumably attempting to flee the scene and get help. He demanded the two young children to stay still as he ran after Slade, and for a moment, he actually thought the teenager had gotten away. Unfortunately, Joseph caught up to Slade in front of the house, where he was standing frozen in confusion from the traumatic head wounds he had endured. Joseph mercilessly struck him in the head, neck, and shoulders several more times with the hammer until he finally dropped to the ground. Before leaving the home, Joseph went back inside to check on Brenda and Mark. He said both were making snoring or mumbling sounds, so he struck each victim's head a few more times. He described not wanting to look as he hit Brenda, so he laid a blanket over her head and swung through it. This is unusual as most perpetrators only cover victims that they know well. It's possible that Joseph struggles to kill women more so than men because of his description of killing Brenda. Additionally, Joseph let Shasta live. We don't know if he planned on eventually killing Shasta, but he didn't murder her right away like he did with Dylan. Joseph insisted that while he knew law enforcement would probably label his crimes rage killings, he wasn't acting out of rage. Instead, he offered the demented explanation that he'd been trying to put his victims out of their misery. Nevertheless, Joseph said he finally departed the residence along with the two children in Mark and Brenda's white pickup truck. He drove the short distance to the additional property where he'd left the stolen red Jeep. There, he abandoned the pickup truck, loaded the children into the Jeep, and took off. Later that day, upon locating the unknown truck on his land, the property owner placed his 911 call that you heard previously. Still, based on Joseph's depiction of the events, investigators were left wondering how the bloodstains came to be distributed throughout the rest of the home if most of the killings were isolated to one room. So they asked Joseph, and his response sent a chill down their spines. As he was driving away, Joseph told investigators that he noticed Slade was standing up again in the front yard. He told them he elected not to stop because daylight was breaking. He knew Slade would die soon from his injuries. Due to the fact that Slade's body was found inside the home next to his mother the following day, authorities speculated that he had managed to re-enter the house and leave blood evidence in various locations before ultimately succumbing to his injuries at his mother's feet. 
It was also believed that he had left the droplets of blood on Mark's body. Joseph admitted to washing the hammer off in the sink before leaving. Authorities were desperate to locate the murder weapon, however uh, his mean, attorneys Jesus prohibited Christ. him from disclosing its location. The interview concluded, and while detectives were relieved to have received a full confession to the Wolf Lodge murders, they still had many unanswered questions. Amongst them, why did Mark and Brenda's truck appear to have been riddled with bullet holes? Yeah, yeah. The guy who narrates this video, or whoever writes the narration, because this guy maybe just, just reads it. I mean, I don't give him leeway, but well, when you watch those videos, we, we already know that this, that this channel, they, they do like dramatization and some really weird like dialogue around the fucking around the stuff so it's ai like it's a, it's a little corny but i'm just telling you so that you know it's it, 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 it there's some corniness here and there while awaiting his federal trial in prison yet another haunting revelation emerged several disturbing videos from joseph's personal social media page Still, no one could have predicted the new set of nightmares about to surface. A document titled Autobiography of Ed Duncan was given to investigators by a former landlord of Joseph's, who said it had been left behind in Fargo. The chilling document, which appeared to have been written during his incarceration as a teenager, detailed his childhood and other significant life events, with strong psychosexual undertones alluding to his deviant desires. 101 pages of journal entries written by Joseph during his time spent in prison in the 1980s shed even more light on his dark side. Around this time in the 80s, he had seemingly developed an alter ego named Jazzy Jet and would post photos of himself online in drag and lingerie for male admirers. Then, after serving 14 years in prison, investigators learned that Joseph was released on parole in 1994. He spent a few additional weeks in jail in 1996 for drug charges, but was released on parole once again after just a few weeks. It was during this time that he apparently crossed paths with 10-year-old Anthony Martinez. On April 4th, 1997, Anthony was playing with his friends and younger brother in Beaumont, California, when he was suddenly abducted at knife point. Countless law enforcement agencies came together to search for the little boy in the following weeks, and tragically, on April 19th, his body was found by a park ranger, roughly an hour from his last known location. Anthony's body showed clear signs of a violent assault, and similar to the Wolf Lodge victims, he had been bound by duct tape. Despite obtaining a partial fingerprint from the duct tape and releasing a composite sketch of the supposed killer, Anthony's case went cold. It wasn't until after his arrest for the Wolf Lodge murders that authorities connected Joseph to the evidence in Anthony's case. On July 12th, Joseph was formally charged with three counts of first-degree murder and three counts of first-degree kidnapping. Joseph confessed to Anthony's murder on July 19th, just a few weeks after Shasta's rescue, but that wasn't the only brutal, unsolved murder he was tied to. Joseph also confessed to murdering two young girls in the Seattle area in July 1996, alleging he beat them both to death. Based on the details he disclosed and the girls having been in close proximity to his residence at that time, authorities believed he was referring to 9-year-old Carmen Hubias and 11-year-old Sammy Ho White. The pair disappeared after leaving a motel parking lot and their skeletal remains were found roughly 17 months later Whoa. on a muddy hillside in Washington. With very little evidence at the time, the case quickly went cold. Investigators were skeptical and speculated that Joseph's confession could be like some of those other serial killers who have claimed credit for things they haven't done. In any case, on October 16, 2006, Joseph entered a guilty plea to the murder and kidnapping charges in court before a judge and was immediately sentenced to three consecutive life sentences without the possibility of parole. Finally, on August 27, 2008, a federal grand jury recommended the death penalty for Joseph. Then, in November of the following year, he was given three additional life terms. Joseph was also charged with the murder of 10-year-old Anthony Martinez from Beaumont, California, and sentenced to two life terms on April 5, 2011, after entering a guilty plea. It's notable that Joseph is wearing a bulletproof vest during his sentencing hearing, 
This is sometimes done when a prisoner needs to be transported outside Minus of the courthouse, lives. and there is a risk that he will be shot at. While Joseph confessed to the murders of the two young girls, Sammy Ho White and Carmen Cubias, he was never charged with those crimes, possibly due to insufficient evidence. The nightmare finally ended on March 28, 2021, when Joseph died in prison from a terminal brain tumor. Someone in chat said Someone in chat said W cancel repose always. <laughs> <laughs> 